So here's the uh, uh, LIN, uh, it's called LDF, description file definition. So it includes the protocol version, whether it's 1.1, 2.1, 2.2a, and so forth. Some of the frames, do you have any sporadic frames, event triggered frames, diagnostic frames? What are these uh, signals within the messages and so forth? So here's the header of an LDF file. So here's the version number. And watch your LIN bus speed. This is very important. Typically, we see 10.417 kilobits per second for J2602. And then we also see 19. Uh, uh, 0.2 kilobits per second. So those are the two common uh, bus speeds that we see out there. And then here's an example of the nodes being defined. So you have a master labeled mirror control and then the slave um, uh, labeled mirror motor. And then you have signals within the messages and then you can see uh, they can be one bit, one bit signals, they can be eight bit signals, they can be 16 bit signals and so forth. And then there's the value at power on reset and then who's the publisher and who's the subscriber. And then the frames here uh, will tell you here that the, um, the ID in this case is 10 and the master is sending out two frames, an ID of 10 and an ID of 20 and it's going to send out 64 bits or 8 data bytes and then it's going to repeat this loop over and over and over and here's a different just a different example of a schedule table where the delay is 100 milliseconds between messages okay so some limitations on lin uh, so 1 kilobit per second up to 20 kilobits per second that's pretty slow uh, like i said 10.417 bits per second for J2602. And then LIN physical layer limits the network to 16 nodes theoretically. And I talked about that earlier about the bus impedance and all that. So, and then don't forget the master counts as a node because it can be a slave as well. So it can send out the master header, but it can send out slave data as well. And then the total length of the bus line is 40 meters max. Uh, LIN errors. Uh, LIN does not have a hardware controller, so there are no uh, hardware error diagnostics. So then uh, detected errors are not sent on the LIN bus. Uh, all of the errors would have to be handled by the ECU firmware. So if you get a checksum miscalculation, then you got to decide what to do with that. So there's checksum errors, there's ID parity errors, uh, there's sync field errors, so maybe you don't get the 55, it turns out to be a AA or a 50 or something. Uh, frame not responding, so you might have a timeout error. The master sends out a header only, but nothing gets sent back from the, from the slave. You could have a bid error and a physical bus error. Uh, from a wake up standpoint, uh, a wake up, uh, a LIN break will actually cause a LIN node to wake up. So the wake up pulse is low on a LIN line for 250 microseconds up to five milliseconds. So a LIN break, which is the 13 bit times, will accomplish the uh, 250 microsecond minimum spec. And that's your LIN break. Uh, so we're not gonna do uh, this lab with, uh, with the Wave BPS, but I did wanna show it to you. So we sell a, uh, a software package called Wave BPS. It's, it's relatively old. Uh, there hasn't been any, been any updates to it in quite a few years. And it does work with a Pico scope. And that scope is not, uh, not designed by Intrepid. We buy it from another uh, third party in Europe, actually. And then we package our Wave BPS software with the Pico scope. But what's nice about this PicoScope and the Wave BPS, I can look at CAN traffic, I can look at flex rate traffic, I squared C, LIN traffic, SPY traffic. So in this example here, you can see that. Uh, what's nice about the Wave BPS software, we have a LIN waveform being shown here in the middle section, and it decodes the, the whole frame. So you can see the break character, you can see the 55 sync character. There's the, you know, the start and stop bit after each byte. Uh, and then here's 01, 01, 02, 03, 04, 05. This is just the data bytes. And then a uh, checksum here at the end. And then it even shows down here uh, in this area here, like every message that comes across the bus, it will do a timestamp and it will show you what the ID is. 
and uh, make sure you have the right sync byte and everything. So it's kind of a log of the, uh, the messages. So that's Wave BPS. What's nice about this too is when you're using a PicoScope, remember I said the LIN voltage can go out as battery voltage. So the OEM specs are nine to 16 volts for normal operations. It go up to as high as 24 volts for a jump start, right? So I have another uh, tool for a logic analyzer called Salee, but it only goes from zero to five volts. So I cannot physically attach the LIN bus to my Salee tool, at least the version that I bought. They have other other versions of that tool that can hand, handle analog voltages, but the the less expensive version that I bought can only go up to five volts. So if I wanna look at the LIN, I could do that if I tap onto the other, sides of, the other side of the LIN transceiver. So if I was able to open up the ECU and tap into that, I could connect my, uh, my Salee tool to the uh, LIN logic level lines going to the microcontroller, but then I'm gonna see a nice clean waveform. So what's nice with the PicoScope, is you know you can expand this waveform out too you don't have to see this view you can look at each bit and you can see if there's noise on the line or what or do i have the right voltage level and so forth so the picoscope is nice from that standpoint um we're going to have two nodes set up so i'm going to use uh two fire twos uh, hooked up back to back and so this is my uh, lab one is gonna be my, uh, this is my network, right? So one fire two is gonna be a master and one uh, fire two is gonna be a slave. So I don't have additional fire twos hooked up. We're just gonna do two channels for this, uh, this exercise. I was at a company yesterday uh, working with them. Uh, they had bought uh, fire two and vehicle spy pro and uh, it's for a tester. So it's for a production tester on the line. And in their case, what they're doing is the first fire two that's acting as a master would be simulating the BCM module in a vehicle. And then uh, they're connected to uh, LIN bus one, two, and three. And there are eight different uh, ECUs connected on all three LIN buses. So the LIN bus one had two ECUs, LIN bus two had uh, three ECUs or slaves, and LIN bus three also had three slaves. So by using our graphical panels and our scripting language, which we're gonna get into in a second here, we were able to set up their uh, master to be a, uh, like I said, the BCM replacement. So it would send out commands to these uh, slaves and it would verify that they received uh, the command and sent a response back. Now they weren't looking for specific responses. All they cared about was continuity. So they were looking to make sure that the slaves responded back to the LIN command. So it was pretty cool. And then what we did is they didn't want to have a computer running uh, on the end of line tester. So you can program the Fire 2, the core mini of Fire 2 to run standalone. So after we had everything uh, uh, tested with the graphical panels and looking at our messages, uh, we programmed Core Mini of the Fire 2, stuck it into the tester, and then it would run standalone when it received a command from the PLC. So that was pretty cool. So Lab 1, I'm going to set up a LIN network. We have this, uh, what we call a logon name in vSpy. I like to think of it more as a project name. So I'm going to create a project called LIN Training 827 2020. And then the platform is where we put our database files. And I like to name my platform the same as my project name. So I'm going to go LIN Training 827 2020 as well. So this is where we would load our LDF file. So lab one, we're going to transmit LIN master messages without an LDF file. So when you're doing a LIN network, you do, you do not have to have an LDF file. You can create your own schedule table, your own LIN messages uh, without having an LDF file. However, an LDF file is nice because if you're working with a customer, an OEM, you know, they're going to share information with you about those uh, slave nodes. And you really need to know what, what IDs those will respond to. 
and what commands they will respond to. Uh, maybe it's a cup holder and it's got an RGB LED ring around it and uh, the master would send out the ID for that certain cup holder and it would also include in the data bytes, hey, make this thing go red or blue or green, stuff like that. And then, uh, so in this lab, we're gonna create two messages for the Lin master. We're gonna create a schedule table manually, not with an LDF file, and then we're gonna just monitor the messages in the message. So let's do that next. We'll pull up the uh, Word doc. And so this is the Word doc that was sent out. So I already have my two Fire 2s connected. I'm gonna open up an instance of Vehicle Spy. And then uh, I'm gonna use the lowest serial number of the Fire 2 as my master and then the higher one as my slave. We just do that in practice at Intrepid just so when we have two instances of vSpy open, we can just remember which one is, which one is the master, which one is the slave. When you're in this view to look at the what's connected and you click on one of the fire twos and then hit connect. Again, remember in our in our vSpy basics class, if the text is in red, there's a, a firmware mismatch error uh, between the what's in the fire two and what vSpy is using. So you need to manually reflash the firmware in the device. And then also we're gonna go into uh, scroll down here because normally you just see can, right? You don't see Lin. So you gotta scroll down and then we're gonna click on the Lin channels and we're gonna set the uh, baud rate for 10417. And for the master, we're gonna set it to uh, master resistor is on. So it's gonna add the 1K pull up resistor. And then we're gonna, when we're done with that, we're gonna hit disconnect. Then we're gonna hit connect and for the other fire two, check the baud rate and then make sure the master resistor is off. So let's do that before we continue. So I'll open up an uh, instance of vSpy. And so you can see there's my two fire twos. I assume that you guys took our vSpy basics class. Uh, so we go into uh, setting up the logon name and the current platform. If this says new or default, you would just click on new and then give it a name. It's that simple. And same with the uh, current platform, you would click on setup and then you would come over all the way to the right and click on setup and then add a brand new uh, directory for, or uh, yeah, directory for the uh, database files. But I've already done that, so I don't have to do it again. So if I go back to file logon, okay, so let's check the hardware. So we'll click on the configure button. We'll do the uh, six nine first because it's the lower denominator. We'll connect to it. Okay, my text is black, so I'm in good shape. I don't have to do a manual reflash. I'll scroll down. Now we're only gonna be on LIN one for this class, but like when I was with the customer yesterday, we had to go through all the uh, LIN buses and um, make sure that the master resistor was on, right? So we need to turn him on. Maybe I'll just do that for all of these, even though we're not using these this time. And make sure I'm on 6.9, yep. And then anytime you make a change in this panel area, you have to click on right settings. If you don't and just disconnect or close out the window, it will not take these, uh, it will not uh, take your changes and write them to EEPROM. So write settings and then disconnect. Now let's go to the uh, other one, the CY3389, we'll connect. And we'll scroll down to Lynn. and the baud rate is the same and we do not have the master resistor on we'll check two three and four okay so now we're set up i didn't make any changes so i'm just going to hit disconnect and i'll go back to my file logon okay so now i'm going to go into i normally when i have vSpy open i like to just open up the messages view 
the message editor view, and the transmit panel view. And you can see we build these tabs across the top here for each one of these views. Okay, let's go back to the uh, document here. So we did this now, we, now we're gonna open up the message editor and we're gonna select Lynn from this pull down menu. Then we're gonna go and transmit table. Now remember, we don't have an LDF file loaded or anything. So this is a brand new instance of vSpy. And then we're gonna hit the plus symbol over here to create two uh, Lynn messages. And then, so what that's gonna do is create TX uh, message Lynn one and TX message Lynn two. And then we're gonna change the type to say master. We're gonna give it some IDs 10 and 11. And then I'm gonna just create some static bytes. And then we're gonna go to the uh, function block uh, and, and get into the scripting. So let's do the message creation first. Go back to my vSpy message editor. So you can see we kind of default to HSCAN and the receive table. So let's go down to uh, Lynn, all the way down. And then notice too, like when I was working with the customer yesterday, there's a Lynn 2 and a Lynn 3 and a Lynn 4 on the Fire 2. So we had to go through and do each one individually. So but we're just on Lynn 1 right now. And then I'm going to click the plus symbol twice. So there's the message Lynn 1 and message Lynn 2. It automatically comes up. Oh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. So I was in the receive table, right? So then it puts slave down here. Okay, I don't want to be in the receive table. So I'm going to hit the minus key twice to delete those messages and go back to the transmit table. Now I'm in the transmit table and now I hit plus twice. Notice it put a TX in front of that. So TX message Lin 1, TX message Lin 2. I do have to change this to master. And I'll change the other one to master. And we're gonna give it an ID of 10 and 11. And then I'm gonna fill in these bytes. Okay. So that's done. Okay, what's next? We're gonna open up function blocks. We're gonna hit the plus symbol. So in vSpy, we use the plus symbol to add, minus symbol to subtract. And now we're gonna create uh, a schedule table. So we're gonna add these four lines to the schedule table. So I wanna transmit out the first Lin message. I wanna delay 50 milliseconds, transmit out the second Lin message, and then delay 50 milliseconds. Then we're going to hit run with transmit and we're going to select, remember, the lowest denominator, uh, fire to CY3369. When I do that, I'm going to see my messages and then I also want to uh, default down to Lynn at the bottom of the screen. So let's go do that. So scripting and automation, function blocks. So if you have two fire twos or if you have two um, value can for two ELs or a fire two and a value can for two EL or maybe a red or a fire and you just want to have two nodes on a CAN bus on a LIN bus then you could load up these files and do exactly what I'm doing. I'm just using the two fire twos because I have a nice connect board it's convenient for me. My eight CAN buses are connected together and my four LIN buses are connected together for me. So I don't need any special cabling or custom cabling or anything like that. So let us know if you want the files and we can send those out. Scripting and automation. Uh, oh, just to let you guys know, uh, I, you guys are kind of the guinea pigs for this uh, updated Lynn class. I did teach um, a version of this with a customer who came in and they, and they came in from another country and so our old Lynn class, uh, I think, needed some work. It left a little to be desired. So I, I updated this Lynn class, and I, I kind of wanted to do a real-world application versus our old Lynn class. So, so that this is really from when I had taught those two gentlemen the Lynn class, and then I added a couple more things to make it a little bit more clear. So, 
hopefully this goes pretty smooth. We only have three hours, so we're an hour into it. I think we'll finish way ahead of time, uh, which is okay. Uh, but normally we would go for four hours because you guys would be doing the hands-on activities yourselves. So, so let's continue function block. And so we have now we have another tab, function block, and I'm going to click plus and I'm going to do a script. So we're going to do a script in this case. Sometimes if this line is way down here, uh, just take it and drag it up to the top. I like to have my text up near the top so I can see it and not at the bottom of the screen. And if I bring up the Word doc here, you can see that we want to add these two messages and then we do a wait for a delay between the two messages. So I don't know if you guys had our scripting course yet. Uh, so we normally teach uh, vSpy basics and then customers will take scripting next, followed by data logging, followed by maybe ISO 14229 diagnostics, followed by LIN or Gateway Builder. So we're kind of, we're kind of jumping the gun a little bit here because you, if you haven't had the scripting class, this is the first time you're seeing this. So you double click on this box though, and these are all of our scripting commands. So there's about 30 of them or so, but it's very simple. If you've never programmed before in your life, it's very easy to use. You don't have to, you know, be a C programmer or Python programmer or whatever. So I would click on uh, transmit to transmit a message. That's how simple it is. And then I'm going to click on over here and it knows from my scheduled, from my message editor, it already knows that I've created a couple of transmit messages. So I would double click on this first one. If you are a hardcore C programmer, you might find our scripting language a little bit uh, uh, not advanced because we don't have a switch statement, but we do have a for uh, for or we don't have a for loop. We don't have, but we do have if then else, you know that type of thing. Uh, we have the set value commands, so it's it's kind of like C, but not really. Uh, but it's it's very easy to use and uh, it gets you up and running. Our scripting class is four hours and we go through how to create the different scripts, how to log data to a file, how to, how to combine uh, scripting with uh, graphical panels, which I'm gonna show you today. Uh, so it's a pretty good class. Next thing I'm gonna do is a wait for, scroll down, wait for, and then I double click on this and I'm just going to type in five zero right there and hit OK. And then now I'll hit transmit there. Double click on this, open up the LIN and now select the second message. And then uh, wait for. And 50 milliseconds. Now, if I wanted this script to only run one time, I would come here and put a stop command. Then it would execute these four lines and then stop. But I don't want that. I want this to be a continuous loop. So, excuse me, I'm just gonna delete that stop command. Okay, and then I'm gonna go up to the top. I'm gonna hit this black down arrow next to the play button. And the reason I have to do this the very first time I have to make a selection on this pull down menu. What am I going to do? Once I make that selection, though, it remembers my selection. So the next time I just have to hit the play button. But now I'm going to do a run with transmit and I'm going to select the one with the lowest uh, denominator serial number uh, 3369. Give it a second, my script is running, so it's showing me what I'm doing in kind of real, semi real time. And if I go now to the message view, you'll see that I just put two LIN messages out on the bus. What we normally do though, is we default down to a CAN layout. So this is a CAN layout with the columns. And if you hit this default, this uh, black down arrow, you'll see that we support CAN FD, so we add some different columns for CANFD. We do Ethernet, Class 2, FlexRay, GM LAN, J1939, LIN. So we're going to select LIN. And what that's telling me is we have this uh, uh, header and slave columns 
right? So now we know that the message going out uh, contains a header and it also contains the slave data, okay? Now notice I don't have another instance of vehicle spy running yet, and I don't have the other fire two running yet. So in CAN, remember you have to have a minimum of two nodes on a bus, and the second node has to acknowledge the CAN message in order for that uh, first node to transmit another message out on the bus or to back off and let another ECU transmit on a bus. So there has to be at least two nodes on a CAN bus. On LIN, I don't have to have that second node here. Um, it doesn't do any good to have one node, but, but I just wanna make that point out that uh, the, the master here is sending out two LIN messages with, with the data on it. And if I were to put my scope on, on the LIN line, I would see these two messages being decoded. So I think that was it for lab uh, one. Let me go back. So we did that, we looked at the message view. So 27 steps, okay? So a couple notes. Uh, so we have the uh, green LEDs for the header and slave columns. Uh, oh, the, we talked about that ID before, 